Cardinal George Pell, once considered one of the Pope's trusted lieutenants, is now facing time in prison. George Pell's walk of shame. It's your guilty Pell, cardinal. Absolute pig. Police shielding the cardinal from abuse outside the county court. You're a monster, mate. You rot in hell. Yeah. This is a major story. The cardinal George Pell was, was the third most important person in the Roman Catholic Church at the Vatican. He was the Vatican's number three, but now he is public enemy number one. You're a pedophile, you three. I'm looking forward, finally, to having my day in court. I'm innocent of these charges. They are false. The whole idea of sexual abuse is abhorrent to me. Cardinal George Pell, the world's most senior Catholic to be convicted of sexually abusing children, has just been sentenced to six years in prison. Twelve men and women found the 77-year-old guilty on all five charges. Good evening, Cardinal George Pell is a free man tonight with the blessing of the highest court in the land. The former Vatican treasurer was released after more than 13 months in prison. The appeal court failed to take proper account of evidence that cast doubt on Pell's guilt. The accusations against him made no sense. This was a grotesque miscarriage of justice. Cardinal George Pell, one of the Catholic Church's most senior authorities and most powerful men, spent 405 days in prison after being accused and convicted of sexual abuse. He became one of the most hated figures in all of Australia, and his guilty verdict was flashed around the world. It was then, after the case made it all the way to Australia's highest court, and seven High Court judges unanimously overturned his conviction, at seven to zero, that he was acquitted and finally freed. Now the Cardinal is back in Rome, and in this Vaticano special, we sit down with him in his apartment for an extended one-on-one -on -one interview. Cardinal George Pell, it's great to meet you and thank you so much for your time. Pleasure, Colm. Your Eminence, we're sitting here in your apartment in Rome, right beside the Vatican, where you were ordained a priest in 1966. How does it feel to be back in Rome? I'm very pleased to be back. I initially wasn't very keen at all to return. I was surprised when so many people said that I should, even my family. And why were you reluctant to come back to the Eternal City? Uh, because I was very well settled in Australia, very well settled uh, in Sydney, uh, happy to be free uh, with a circle of uh, friends doing a bit, uh, not too much. And then I moved to a very uh, nice house, planned a new garden at the back, planted lots of roses, lavender and um, an olive tree and all things uh, like that. So I was well settled. Why did you then come back to Rome? Well, I suppose it was part of my uh, uh, the reassertion of my in uh, innocence um, and also I was keen to see and thank the Holy Father for his support and I've got many friends in Rome. One of the interesting things in Rome was that even my ideological enemies didn't believe that I was guilty. Now one reason for that was because they knew what a cathedral is like after a big mass on Sunday. Uh, many of the people in Australia, even a, f a few of those who were helping me, you know, think of churches as being small and empty and nobody around. But um, in a cathedral on Sunday, we were, you know, there are hundreds at the big mass, 50 in the choir, 15 servers, half a dozen people in the sacristy, plus uh, the visitors. Uh, uh, the uh, suggestion that I would have attacked two youngsters I didn't know, nobody said I knew them, in such circumstances is doubly implausible. What is that like to be 
accused and convicted of sexual abuse like that? No, it's not pleasant, um, which goes without saying. Um, it means that you have to go back to basics. You have to... Uh, well, one of the things I've been saying since I've come out is that uh, if we're ever in difficulties, the first thing is we have to admit to ourselves where we are, not where we would like to be, not uh, losing ourselves in laments about what has happened, but uh, say, well, here we are, what can we make uh, uh, of this? And uh, my faith was a great help um, because one of the great differences between us and people without religion is that we believe uh, in some mysterious way uh, suffering can be turned to good. So many people wrote to me and said they were offering their suffering for me. A young fellow who was dying. Uh, a woman wrote and said that she was about to give birth. She said she would offer up the, birth, the pains of childbirth for me. She said she had a spectacularly difficult birth and said she wasn't keen to, to be doing that again. Uh, but so I felt I could offer up my suffering for the good of the church, um, for the victims, uh, for my family, for, for, for my friends, and uh, uh, that helps. And it also helps to realise that uh, ultimately there's, there's one judgement that's supremely important, and that's before the good God when you die. Now, if I had thought that death was the end of everything, that the ultimately important thing was my earthly reputation, uh, well, obviously my approach would have been different. Did you always believe that you would be vindicated, or did you believe at times when you were in prison that you would have to wait until that, as you say, ultimate judgment to get justice? Well, I was very um, shaken by the, uh, the decision of the Victorian Supreme Court, where two judges found against me. I couldn't believe it. So I briefly, more than half seriously, thought, you know, it costs a lot of money to carry the appeal to the High Court. If the judges are just going to close ranks. Uh, why go ahead with this expensive charade? Uh, so at I, times were you thinking, I might have to see this through for yes, the, the six yes, years? Yes, I was, I was. And of course, and then even after that, when I more rationally, and all my friends said, you know, you've got to appeal, and I recognise it, also for the sake of the church. Mm -hmm. um, but I also re uh, realised, uh, rationally, I knew we had an overwhelmingly strong case. No jury could convict me. I knew rationally that my case was enormously strong. But, but things are not decided on rationality. And that uh, appeal court uh, decision in Victoria reminded me of that. So no, I was well aware that I might have been stuck there for three years. How do you handle being public enemy number one in an entire country, because this is one of the most high profile court cases in the history of Australia. Mm -hmm. It seemed like the majority of public opinion was against you. Mm -hmm. It seemed like the majority of the press, particularly the public service broadcaster ABC, they were painting you to be uh, this evil, guilty man before anything got into the courtroom. Mm -hmm. How do you as a person cope with that mentally? Well, it's not pleasant. Uh... I mean, you, uh, mind you, I'd coped with uh, a little bit of this during my career, and I always hadn't, uh, I, uh, you know, I hadn't found the, the role entirely uncongenial. Uh, but, I mean, the infamy I was in was at a new level. Mm -hmm. And um, the only thing you can do, of course, is label to br labor to present the truth. Uh, one of the, uh, the things you might have noticed in, in, in the journal was that there was someone or other um, who sort of uh, recommended when you're in a situation like mine, you should leave everything to God and do nothing. Now, I explicitly rejected that approach. Now, I was a little bit consoled by the fact that Thomas More, the Englishman who was martyred, 
had uh, talked about this topic and his, and his whole story, he was a very astute lawyer, he did what he could for as long as he could to stave it off. And I felt uh, for my own sake and for the sake of the church, uh, but also for the sake of the genuine victims, the only thing that works for us in the long term is the truth. Any sort of uh, settlement that is based on lies, uh, almost certainly is not going to last. Somebody will blab. Uh, and so we worked uh, to get the truth out. So why do you think it was God's will that you were in that situation? I've got no idea. the journals, you say, I believe in God's providence. I never chose this situation and I worked hard to avoid it, but here I am and I must strive to do God's will. So why do you think it was God's will that you were in that situation? Got no idea. You still don't know after thinking about it for so long. No, no, no. God's providence works in uh, very strange ways. How did it affect the Catholic Church in Australia, the entire case? Oh, well, uh, I mean, it was a big blow uh, that uh, uh, a leading churchman like myself, one was accused and then found uh, guilty. Now, uh, for uh, some people, that was entirely congenial. Um, a lot of Catholics, I think the great majority of the church-going Catholics, not all by any means, uh, stuck with me. You write... I'm caught in a struggle between good and the spirit of evil, and I have never felt this more strongly. What was going through your head when you wrote that? Well, I don't like to see those things regularly in these terms. I'm a bit uh, reluctant to uh, describe things as a conflict between the spirit of evil and good. I'm well aware that that's an essential part of every person's story. We've all got to struggle against our weaker, badder selves, and certainly that fault runs right through society. I really felt, uh, well, the devil was certainly at work in the crimes committed in the pedophilia crisis. And uh, I think the, uh, uh, the hatred for the church, the genuine outrage that was uh, felt by people in the front of these crimes uh, was to some extent twisted and perverted and people uh, wanted a scapegoat. Now, I know even in the courtroom um, at different stages, quite a number of uh, my friends have told me, uh, opponents of mine have said, yeah, he might be innocent, but the church deserves to take a knock because of the dreadful things that were done and the poor way it was handled. What was it like in prison? What was an average day for you like? Actually, it wasn't too bad. Really? Uh, yeah. I, uh, uh, I mean, you're in prison, mm -hmm. you're powerless, you're at the bottom of the pile, nothing happens quickly. It's designed so that nothing happens quickly. You know, you ask for something, it might or mightn't be done in three days or... Uh, or a week. One long-term prisoner uh, paid me the compliment of saying he'd been in prison for 30 years. He'd never heard a Catholic priest defended by prisoners uh, before some prisoners in the jail came to my defence. I, I remember listening one night as in the, the cells down the road as, uh, you know, down the path, mm. down the... You could hear them uh, I could hear them arguing as whether yeah. I was guilty or not. Did you ever question, God, where are you right now? Oh, yes. I, I mean, I'm still not quite sure how he, uh, how or what he was up to, but uh, life is often like that. Uh, I mean, many bad things happen to uh, good people, and, uh, I mean, I've had many, many blessings in my life. I've had a bit of a rough road the last few years, but I've, um, you know, I've, I've, I've had a 
blessed life, some would say a charmed life. It's easy to say that now, looking back as a free man, but at the time, like then that first appeal, there was a moment when you thought, I might have to see out this six years, I'm sure. Well, I would have been three years something or four years something. Yes, I was well aware that was a real possibility. That old role that you did have overseeing the, the finances or mm -hmm. restructuring the finances, um, what, how challenging was that? I remember reading you saying that when you took on the role, you never realised how technicolour was the word you used, which was a great choice of word, I thought. What did you mean by that? Um, I, I didn't uh, quite realise just uh, uh, the level of sophistication, uh, corruption, and a good measure of incompetence that would be there. But uh, I'm, my, my successor is a, a good man, a competent man. He's heading in the right uh, direction and uh, I totally support him. I just hope he's not thwarted. You know, the Holy Father says there's got to be an investment committee uh, set up to manage the Vatican investments. We recommended that five years ago honest, really professional investors and given effective control. Uh, and that's, that's what my successor wants. So I fully support that so that we can get away from this shadowy world that uh, the Vatican has dealt with, not always, but so many times for decades. And I remember in 2014, I think, you had announced that you had found several hundred millions of euro in a part of an account and that no, wasn't... No, no, I, I, we had found something like 1.3 or 1.4 billion in the accounts which hadn't been declared. Now, but that's not just a Vatican thing. I, I was talking to somebody who was an Italian businessman with branches all around Italy and he said, yeah, it was, it's quite similar in his business too. People put the money aside for a rainy day. I, we weren't saying that this money was being used uh, corruptly, but it just wasn't on the books. I have to be very careful how I phrase this next question and how I put it, but let me ask you about the link that some people have been drawing or speculating about between the work you were doing, overseeing the finances at the Vatican, the restructuring and the opposition you were coming up against in doing your work, a link between that and then the accusations that suddenly appeared in Australia, you having to leave your job here and going to face them. Your opinion on that theory? Well, there's uh, a lot of smoke. A lot of the people who were working for serious reform here believed there was a connection amongst my supporters in Australia almost nobody believed that there was a uh, connection. Uh, we now know that uh, uh, quite a number of the criminal elements around the place uh, hoped that I would come to grief uh, in Australia. Uh, whether they knew more than that, uh, uh, we don't know. Uh, you know there's even suggestion, uh, some would say, well, you know, Pell's out of the way, the road is opening before us. We don't have proof. We don't have proof. Um, but we'll see. As you said before, time will tell. Well, we hope. You, not always, but we hope. And I hope it's not true, because it is pretty infamous. My family said to me, look, it's one thing if the Mafia go after you or the Masons go after you, but... If it's uh, the Vatican. Uh, but yes, and uh, actually a, a sympathetic cardinal whom I know well, I was talking to him and he said that if that was true, it'd be the most infamous thing of all. But we don't, we don't have proof. What but there is evidence. There is evidence. But, but no proof. Okay. What was your reaction to Pope Francis dismissing Cardinal Angelo Becciu? Well, um, I put out a little statement. I said, I hope the cleaning of the stables in both my state of Victoria and the Vatican continues. I, I will say this, I think uh, Petru has a right to a trial. Like everybody else, he's got a right to uh, due process. Um, so let's just see where we go. Where are you going to go? What is your hope and dream now for forging ahead here in Rome? 
Um, I hope to, uh, my health continues for a while. Uh, I'll do a little bit of this. I, I follow the church life closely here and there and I'm able to do a little bit of writing and uh, speaking. And uh, I suppose like every good Christian, I should try to prepare for a good death. And you have two more volumes coming out of the prison diaries? I do, yes. Yeah, I, I thought I'd be in for three or four months, which would probably give me one volume. And when I lost the appeal, I nearly stopped writing. But I thought, oh, no, no, I'm, it's good therapy. And I might be able to say something that, that might help. So uh, I've, uh, a lot of people in jail write. The final piece I have here from the journals, Jail means plenty of penance for me this Lent, which will balance out a little the absence of stiff penance over many years. Yes. You said, I do not deeply regret this, all, although more should have been done. When you had time sitting in the cell and you were looking back and you were pondering in hindsight things that had happened, did you have any deep regrets about the way things were handled? Did you think I should have done this, we could have done this better in the handling? of some of the sexual abuse cases that came before you? Oh, well, now, that's a, that's a different thing uh, in terms of the sex abuse cases. Um, once I became Archbishop in Melbourne, I met uh, the governor at the time. Uh, he'd been a Supreme Court judge. Uh, we were at a Catholic function at breakfast, and he said to me, I want to talk to you about your problems. And I said, oh, what are they, knowing full well what he wanted? And he said, this sex abuse. Uh, now, he was quite prophetic, but he said, unless you deal with it, it will bleed you for decades. Now, it's done that in any case. But what he said was, set up an independent uh, investigator. Give him authority, a bit like a Catholic royal commission, uh, and let him go ahead. We also set up uh, a system to give counselling and to provide compensation. A lot of people now say it wasn't as, uh, enough, as much compensation as it was, but it, the amount was set in terms of the amount available for compensation for crimes um, at, the, at the time. So from the moment I was Archbishop, whenever I got uh, an accusation, I immediately put it into the process. Do you think the faith will come back? Of course it will. Of course it will. Does it sadden you or anger you, Your Eminence, when you look at the case you went through in the trial and the fact that some people watching this still believe you're guilty, does it anger you? No, it doesn't. It certainly doesn't. doesn't anger me. I regret it. Mm. But all I'd say to those people is, have a look at the evidence. And as I've said many times, not even a credible witness can be in two places at the one time. Again, we're sitting here in your apartment, right beside the Vatican, where you were ordained back in 1966. When you look back at this, whole experience from the moment you were accused, going through the courts, going through the trial, going through your time in jail until we're sitting here now. How has it changed you as a person and as a priest? Well, I suspect there's very little improvement. Uh, you still have your sense of humour. Please God. Oh, no, I, well, I, uh, people don't always give me credit for that, but no. I, I think I do. <laughs> and your uh, modesty. I, no, I don't know about the modesty. Well, the one thing I, as I, I think I've already said, you know, I think my experience has deepened my conviction that the Christian package works. But what about the young people in Ireland? I know my friends who have fallen away from the faith will say, why should we be a member of the Catholic Church? Why should we be part of this faith when all they have read about for years in Ireland is the abuse cases coming out? Well, well I'd remind them. I mean, but, I mean, you. The church in Ireland is like me, to this extent. We can't pretend we're somewhere other than where we are. We have to 
face up to the shameful facts. If they're, but we're not preaching me or the bishops. We're preaching Christ and his message and his teachings and the communities that believers uh, form. And you also got to look not just at the headlines and what the anti-religious uh, press say, but look at the things we've done in history. Uh, look at the contribution we've made you know, to human welfare. It's enormous, enormous. Uh, we, we also have a glorious history, glorious history. And uh, let the young people actually um, have a bit of a look at that. See what Christ says, read what he says, read, have a look at the Gospels. Uh, he's the person we're following, not, uh, not the ex-Archbishop of Melbourne or Sydney. Do you think the faith will come back? Of course it will. Of course it will. But uh, it won't unless people step up to the plate. Well, on that note, Your Eminence Cardinal George Pell, it's been a pleasure meeting and chatting to you and thank you so much for your time. Good, thank you, Colin.